Uh, I'm Katie Good, uh, developer at Triangular Pixels, and I've created a game called Smash It Thunder. So, when I was younger, I always wanted to play Finders Keepers or uh, Supermarket Sweep. The big old TV shows. Uh, so when making Smash It Plunder, the idea of the game is you get to effectively do that. You get to run around the dungeon, uh, you're in the time limit, just smashing the place up, just looking for treasure, as much treasure as you can. Um, there's like different game modes where you can sort of do other things, uh, but that's the bitch that we're trying to show. Um, we actually started our development in June, um, and we we got the device and we knew what we wanted to build for it. Um, but yeah, we, we couldn't announce it, we couldn't announce the device to the world, so we really wanted to start prototyping and really trying out the, the idea, so when the idea was three weeks old, we took it to a place called Ladycade, where female developers show off all their ideas, it's a really nice, social, friendly place, and um, so we had to use a original Oculus Rift and a wireless mouse uh, for the touchpad placement. The problem with the wireless mouse was everyone assumed it was a motion controller and started waving their arm around going, ah, I can't move my hand, it's like, it's, it's a mouse, unfortunately, it's not a motion controller. Um, yeah, that's where it came from. Yeah, it's basically, it's player empowerment, um, player agency and player empowerment. So player agency is feeling like you're actually doing something there and you really feel like you're there by like the effect you're having in the world. And the empowerment basically comes from, I can do anything I want. Like, no one's telling me off. Like, I can go and run over in that corner over there and just sit there and smash things, or I can go and just pick up this huge thing and then try and just break the game. So that's where the empowerment comes from, which is why I guess you feel almost like a bit like a superhero. It's like, you don't get to do that in real life. You're doing very naughty things you don't get to do in real life. So basically, the Gear VR, you've got a controller built in, and it's a shame to almost not use that. It's a case of, well, we don't know if someone's going to be able to buy a controller or not. If, like, if you own a Gear VR, we want you to be able to play our game. We're like, we don't want the controls to be a boundary. And I feel like, as well, that when you're trying to give a device, especially like a new controller to someone, and they don't know that controller, they want to check it all the time, have to take off the unit all the time, it's like, oh, what are the buttons, etc. So especially like in a scenario like this, where we're showing it at an event, just having the one button means that like anyone can play it. So I've had really young people from as young as three and a half play it to 75 year olds play it at Game City. So um, with smaller screens, I just felt like that you need a really crisp art style that you can really see all the features of something. At the end of the day, if you're trying to produce something that looks really realistic, you're gonna need a lot of art resources, something probably a bit more than a mobile phone to be able to do it in. And the, the art style that we want to go to, the simplest art style, as well as the fact that we had these technical limitations of a phone, just meant we just naturally fell into this pixelated world. And then in the day, being able to run around inside a video game is ultimately what we all really wanted to do, rather than necessarily go somewhere which we might have been before. So the Gear VR obviously is a mobile device, so it has got visual limitations, but I love designing within those limitations. It's the fact it's a wireless device and it feel, you feel so free when you're moving around is fantastic. You just need to create a game that really exploits that. It's like, okay, let the players turn around, let the players feel like they're free within the game rather than constrained to a cockpit. And then there's also the fact that the, the fact is the, the input's actually built in. It's so useful because it's like, we know the players are going to have that. And so it's just how we use that is up to us. And I'm sure we have some really clever ideas of how we use it. So you've got so many contextual interactions in the game. You know, you can swing open doors, you can create like create some really special effects in secret places. And there's all sorts. You're trying to look into different, really new interactions as well. So you're not just picking up things and throwing things. And then there's the fact that it's a known platform. Like, if you try and produce something for just a straight Oculus or for PC, if you've only got the one PC or the two PCs between you and they're both the same specs, it's going to be hard to like play test it on like lower spec machines, higher spec machines, there's loads of different types of machines, there's Macs. It's like we don't really have the resources necessary to do that straight away as our first game. So, known platform, brilliant. 
Input controls, fantastic. Wireless, amazing. And the fact that we have one, <laughs> so it really helps. <laughs> so in terms of like replayability, you're going to be able to increase your high score and try and get better and better. And we're going to look at also potentially having our shared screen, which is the multiplayer screen that you've seen there. It's like just see if we can put that in, how we're going to distribute it. There's a lot of ifs and buts around it. Um, to be honest, if you come around to various events that we're going at, then you'll be able to try out stuff sooner because we're going to be te play testing those. We want to see people's reactions before we roll them out to everyone. All the chances for all the platforms, effectively. We're going to be looking at other platforms and meeting with people, seeing what they have to offer. Uh, but also looking at how the game performs on Gear VR. Um, so we see if people enjoy it. Uh, people seem to be enjoying it here in the events, but when they actually download it themselves and try it themselves in their own space, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and then look at other platforms and look at uh, other hardware as well. You know, it's not just the one input method, potentially. Might look at controllers. So it's just a case of one, first things first, let's get this out, let's get this working, let's see if people enjoy it and then see where we are after that. Yeah, we really don't know. It's a case of like, see how things go, like, especially because I'm so passionate about playtesting and put it on people's faces and making sure people are happy with it before letting it go. Um, for example, um, we demoed at Game City, which wasn't too far from what we got there, but we didn't have the extra comfort modes in. So this is where you've got Blink Walk, which is sort of stepping you forward, and the Dark Walk, which brings in the fog. Um, so we saw people were wobbling, and we thought, oh, we need to make sure people don't do that strange wobble when they're walking. And so that we, we came up with those modes because of that playtesting. And even when it comes to the dungeon layout, we've also already found some tweaks that we really want to do, because we find that people automatically go for the one spot or stay in the one sort of area. Um, so yeah, as a game designer, it's like, I have a lot of things I want to tweak. <laughs> I just need to see people first, see how they react in the game.